Workers at Fukushima Daiichi have discovered a new challenge in their efforts to decommission the nuclear plant. They've found the level of water in one of the reactors is lower than they thought. They say they don't know whether it even covers all the nuclear fuel inside. What the fuck? They say they don't know whether it even covers all the nuclear fuel inside. The workers use robotic probes to measure the level and temperature of cooling water inside the vessel. They'd used pictures taken two years ago to estimate that the water was 60 centimeters deep. Now, they found it's only around 30 centimeters. And they say that suggests it's keeping the melted fuel cool. Still, officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company say the temperature is around 35 degrees Celsius. They suspect water is leaking through a pipe into a unit called a suppression chamber. And they say that suggests it's keeping the melted fuel cool. They suspect water is leaking through a pipe into a unit called a suppression chamber. They believe it's flowing through holes in the chamber, then out of the reactor building. Workers are planning to plug the holes, then they'll add water to the vessel and remove the fuel from the reactor. They believe it's flowing through holes in the chamber, then out of the reactor building. What's <laughs> so funny now? I sometimes just think funny things. <laughs> Workers are planning to plug the holes, then they'll add water to the vessel and remove the fuel from the reactor. First your ass is backed up, now the toilet's backed up. And if you're not gonna have the right attitude about it, fuck it, I'll just shit on you. Hi, Anthony Sullivan here with the pushover plunge. Now check this shit out. We got all this blue shit in here, that's cool, but guess what? I got this pushover plunge, just grab it from the top and give it all you got. <laughs> Residents near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have begun to return to their homes as workers decontaminate those regions. But a recent survey has found that radiation levels in some areas are still much too high. And if you're not going to have the right attitude about it, fuck it, I'll just shit on you. High radiation areas are designated as no-entry evacuation zones. More than 20,000 people are registered as residents of those areas. They are unlikely to be able to return to their homes for several years. And there you have it. Clean as a whistle. It doesn't take a fucking genius. You push down and you get 25 times more pressure. The pushover plunge is going to work with any size toilet, any size clog, any size shit. I don't care, it's going down. Environment Ministry officials did decontamination work in the zones to see how far they can reduce radiation levels. They chose residential areas, farmlands, roads, and public facilities as sampling spots. If you don't do anything, it'll just overflow. And churning the dookie butter doesn't help either. That shit's disgusting. It's time to keep it clean and sanitary so you never have to touch that shitty water ever again. And it fits in your pocket. Shit anywhere. The test results show that an Average radiation levels, uh, that average radiation levels rather decreased by 50 to 70 percent after workers removed surface soil and washed roads and buildings. But the levels are still more than 10 times higher than the government standard for requiring decontamination. It's another typical dinner at the Garcia family fiesta. All they did was eat bean burritos and they clogged that shit up. It's not going anywhere. It's time to use the pushover plunge and get that shit out of there. Ministry officials say it is difficult to completely remove radioactive substances that have penetrated mi uh, minute crevices on road surfaces and uh, roofs. Seconds. Is your toilet backed up and being stubborn just like your girlfriend? Well, no more. Just grab her by the back of the head and... The results encouraged some residents but disappointed others. I want the government to decontaminate the area so we can get our lives back. So I've always been self-conscious of using public restrooms and I always clogged the toilet. But ever since I've been using the pushover plunge, I could bring it with me wherever I need to. <laughs> I'm going to need it right now. We have no other choice but to go forward. The radiation levels are too high. How many toilets did I break back in my day? Several, but now I have the pushover plunge, so... <laughs> Who am I kidding? They break anyways. <laughs> yes. 
I don't feel like going back, even if the trial decontamination work succeeded in reducing the radiation. Pooping's always been a problem for me. Plumbers just can't handle my pipes. But with a pushover plunge, I can poop as hard as I want, and it feels so good. <laughs> Officials will now consider whether to carry out full-scale decontamination in those areas while consulting with evacuees about whether they would like to return to their hometown. Get ready to start plunging your shit down the toilet for just ten dollars. But I know what you're thinking. You shit twice as much, so I'll double the value. You'll shit everywhere. Upstairs, downstairs, at your friend's house. The government plans to offer financial assistance to residents who give up their plans to return home and start a new life elsewhere. The chairwoman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission spent the day in southwest Michigan touring Palisades and Cook power plants. Allison McFarlane and Congressman Fred Upton met with officials from both plants as they toured them. They wanted to see where the facilities are as they implement safety changes after the Fukushima disaster in Japan after the tsunami. Well, they say the discussions went very well and Cook seems to be ahead of Palisades. We had uh, thorough briefings about both plants. We had good tours of, of both facilities in general. Both facilities have their own sets of issues, uh, but each is performing well. Um, and, uh, and they're working on air areas that uh, we and they have identified uh, for improvement. McFarland says they're satisfied both plants are operating safely. You might remember Palisades has been shut down several times in recent years because of problems. And the NRC called it one of the four worst performing nuclear plants in the country. Fukushima. The word still sends shivers down the spine for many. It was the nuclear power station hit by that tsunami in March 2011 that caused incredible damage and meaning that more than a quarter of a million people had to leave their home, their land and the surrounding area. Now the Japanese have started constructing an underground ice wall to slow the build-up of radioactive water. And it's that water that's really a worry. In fact, I didn't realise how much that I did some reading about uh, sort of what was actually held in that water. Now, Mark Willisey was the ABC's man in Japan at the time of the disaster. He reported frequently there, quite extraordinary television reports, and wrote a great book, which I read from cover to cover, and it was a ripper of a read. Mark, thanks for coming in. G'day, Steve. Thanks. Just tell me, first of all, you uh, spent how long at Fukushima? Well, I was there basically as soon as the disaster happened. Um, I'd been based in Japan since 2008, and... Uh, I was actually down south the day the earthquake hit, so I didn't really feel it, but my wife was in Tokyo with our three daughters and she huddled, huddled under the table for, I think she said about six minutes with our then baby girl, and um, I knew something was wrong when something flashed up on my smartphone, and mm -hmm. they said a big earthquake's hit, six metre tsunami, then it became a nine metre tsunami, then they said anything over 10 we're expecting to hit the coast any second, so it was get back to Tokyo. And then you tell your wife, honey, I have to go to the very cause of the problem. Yeah. What did she say to you? Well. At that stage, it was everyone was concentrating on the the total devastation caused by the tsunami. It really, we didn't have a handle on just how bad Fukushima was going to be. Mm. And and having re read the book and interviewed the key players, neither did I, they at the time. In fact, the prime minister of the day he told me on the day and the day after he was getting no information whatsoever. So, if he's not getting any information, neither was the general public. So we we're all in the dark at that stage. You, um, you flew in there and reported from in and around the area. Where did you stay? I mean, you, you were flying into a radioactive zone, essentially. Yeah, it was um, certainly in the early days, you had to be very careful about where you went and you'd carry a Geiger counter and it'd screech and carry on and you'd know, well, we better get out of here quick, smart. But you'd stay fairly well inland. Okay. Obviously, the, the, the nuclear power plant was built on the coast. They're built on the coast, so if there is a disaster, they can cool the reactors quickly with seawater if necessary. So it, it involved a lot of travel and uh, often travel through some very eerie ghost towns and communities that no longer existed really except uh, for the buildings. If you want a good read, Mark's book is simply called Fukushima. It's published in Australia by Pan Macmillan. It was a ripper. I don't want to go over the book now, but I want you to update me as to where we are today because they're starting what for me is actually quite you know a pivotal moment in the story of Fukushima. They're, they started constructing an underground ice wall to slow the build-up of radioactive water. Now, just explain the, these water towers and what's being held in them very precariously at the moment. Yeah, that. the problem with this site, Steve, is that it's on the uh, it's on the bed of an old river. So they built it there, and they knew that. And even before all this disaster, they were pumping water out from underneath the foundation. So this has been a problem since before the accident. And of course, 
Since the accident, the nuclear cores have melted. They've gone leached through some of the uh, pressure vessels and through, going through what they're called the containment vessels, big concrete uh, bunkers that's tr trying to hold this fuel in. But anyway, what's happening is a lot of this water's leaking through the site, thousands and thousands of litres every day, coming off a hillside, down through the site and out to sea. And what's happening is it's becoming irradiated, highly contaminated. So they've had to pump it out and they've had to store it. They've got thousands and thousands of tanks on site and they're just simply running out of room. They haven't got enough tanks. So they've got to stop the water getting into the site. And this is the theory that they're now going to put into practice is they're going to drill a series of piles into the ground and they're going to freeze those piles. Those piles, I believe, are about a metre, a metre and a half apart. And once the piles themselves freeze, the ground in between them will also freeze. So they're creating a 1.5 kilometre barrier, an ice wall, to stop this water getting into the site. It's really cutting-edge technology, but it also shows you just how dire the situation is and how short of answers they are. So that they're making this up as they go along. A little bit, yeah. This this has never happened before. Of course, we've had Chernobyl, but that was nowhere near a coastline. This is the greatest nuclear contamination of the ocean in history, and it's going on every day. Thousands of litres leaching into the uh, into the Pacific. So they've got to do something, and it's never been done on this scale. Nothing like this. And and there is some fear amongst experts that it's not going to it's not going to work. They're going to spend billions and billions. It's not going to work. And also, you you know, Fukushima can get up towards 35, 40 degrees in summer. <laughs> You're going to have to be pumping a lot of power. Apparently, it's going to take nearly a whole power station to keep this wall frozen. Crikey. My what? guess is Mark Willisey. He wrote the book Fukushima. As you know, he reported from the site. They're building an ice wall to slow the build-up of radioactive water. If the water is leaching out into the ocean, it's going into the marine life, to the food chain, um, and the results could be who knows what and they're desperate to try and stop that. How much has leaked out, do they know? Do you know? No, it, it, it can't be quantified, but it's it's incredible amounts. But, you know, depending on who you talk to, Steve, this is a great catastrophe, or it's not such a bad thing because it's been dispersed over the biggest ocean in the world. And, in fact, uh, TEPCO, the operator of the nuclear plant, right now is trying to convince people in Japan that all these tanks of irradiated water, contaminated water that are being stored in site should actually be tipped into the ocean because they're running out of room. They may still TEPCO need... TEPCO was arguing that. That's right. Um, the Tokyo and, Electric Power Company is saying, let us tip this radioactive water into the Pacific. That's what they're saying. They're saying, look, it, it'll be so diluted, it won't affect anything. But, of course, if you're a fisherman off the coast of Fukushima, it doesn't <laughs> sort of appear that way, does it? Don't eat the fish oil tablets that come from the Pacific. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been on fishing boats a couple of times off Fukushima where we've, uh, with fishermen who can't fish anymore, but they're allowed to go out and take test catches. And each time, I think the first uh, time... Uh, a third of the fish were well above the safe limit and the second time it was about the same figure. So, you know, their industry has been curtailed and, you know, what we think about Japan or what, what the Japanese think about fish, it, they consume more sea life than any other country per capita on the planet. My guest is Mark Willisey. So if this doesn't work, this ice wall, which is taking nearly a power station to generate the electricity to keep the thing cold, uh, if it doesn't work... What options do they have left? Well, I think the only option they have is to dump it into the sea. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying that's the practical nature of what they'll be facing. And if it doesn't work, we're really, we're really back to square one. So they're going to be pumping billions and billions into this. There's going to be months and months and months spent on doing this. And it is the, the great last hope that the TEPCO has, and I believe the government, if it, if it doesn't work, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think anyone knows how to solve the problem. I assume there are scientists from around the world assisting on this project of the building the ice wall, is it? I believe so, yes. The French have already offered um, some expertise, as have the Russians, the, the British and the Americans. The Japanese initially were very reluctant to let any outsiders in, but I think yeah, they've come to the realisation they cannot do this alone, and it is a global issue. Just remind me, I was in the beginning of your book, I think, when the seriousness of what occurred there became known and the Japanese Prime Minister sort of suggested they let some foreign troops in. And I think there was some objection to that and he said, do you realise what this means? Can you recall what I'm talking about? There was... You know, it was, he, he said that we might not have a choice. Yeah, what it came down to was the Japanese Prime Minister told me that he, he, he was confronted with this scene where TEPCO wanted to pull its workers out of the nuclear plant. It was in meltdown. It was just going to hell in a handbasket. And he said, no, if you do that, that whole thing will melt down. All, the, all the, 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 the fuel pools containing used fuel rods will melt down. There's another nuclear plant just 12 kilometres down the coast. That will have to be abandoned. He said it would like being a, be in a chain reaction 
Tokyo would be threatened. And he said, Japan as a state as we know it would cease to function and foreign troops would have to come in. Japan, like 1945, will be occupied again. We cannot let that happen. No, those workers cannot leave. They will have to die if necessary. And that's, that's the situation. Now, I've been attacked for writing that in the book by pro-nuclear advocates who said, oh, it was never that bad, it wasn't that bad. Well, look, the Prime Minister of the day was telling me that's what he was confronted with. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with him on that issue. One of the other things in your book surprised me was that the people at the top who'd been promoted to uh, run the plant and run TEPCO weren't necessarily nuclear engineers, but they were res economists. So they could add up, but they didn't know much about nuclear technology. Yeah, it's sort of, it's so tragic. It's almost funny, isn't it? Um, yes. You know, the Prime Minister, Naito Khan, said to me, he hauled in the head of the Nuclear Safety Agency and he said, right, what's going on? And, and this guy gave him a sort of mumbled response and he didn't seem to be very convincing. And Naito Khan said, well, what are your qualifications here? And he said, well, look, I'm a graduate of Tokyo University. That's the greatest university in the land. But that was in economics. Uh, in Nato Khan's, he said to me, it was then that I knew it was up to me, not the Nuclear Safety Agency, not TEPCO, to try and solve this problem. But it does show you how a system like in Japan where whoever the next bureaucrat in the line is, he gets the next job. But it not, doesn't necessarily work. It was at that point I had to put down your book and go for a walk and say, so economists are running the nuclear industry, you know, rather than the engineers. I was gobsmacked anyhow. Yeah. Okay, so ha when will we know if this ice wall that they're building now, when will we know if it's going to be successful or not? Oh, it's going to take months, Steve. You know, there's a lot of work to do. I believe um, they've started drilling the holes for the piles. Um, it's underway. And look, knowing the Japanese, there's one thing they're very good at is, uh, is tackling a problem reasonably quickly. Not, you know, obviously... The new meltdowns was a problem they really hadn't experienced before. But if you take the tsunami, within days they'd um, gone into communities and they'd put pontoon bridges across uh, rivers. They'd started cleaning up. I think they'll attack this with a fairly uh, concerted and unified front. Um, so I think we'll know probably within 12 months whether it works. The site itself, the site is still radioactive? Very radioactive. Can't go in there without suits or anything like that? No. In, in fact, you know, it's going to take them 40 years to decommission it. In fact, they don't even know exactly where these melted radioactive cores are. You know, they know that they're down there somewhere. I asked TEPCO just before I left Japan in December where they thought it was, and they said, look, well, we think one's eaten through about a metre of the concrete containment vessel, but we can't be sure. So, you know, a lot of guesswork. What is the melted stuff? Is it molten metal? Is it molten uranium? It's, is the, it? it's the actual nuclear fuel rods. So they're, they're, uh, they're sort of zirconium-coated uh, uh, material, uranium. Uh, there was uh, some with plutonium mix in there as well called mix oxide. Um, highly, highly radioactive, of course, mm -hmm. um, and they have to keep pumping this water in. That's the problem, to keep it cool, because if they stop pumping water in, well, it's just going to heat up again. And the more they pump it in, the more they pump it in, that creates more radioactive water. Well, that's right. Water's been the curse from the start here. The tsunami, then pumping the water in, creating more, um, more contaminated water, contaminating the Pacific. Water's the key. And the, the Fukushima area itself, has anyone been allowed back into their properties or land yet? Yeah, not, not in those immediate uh, communities right next to the plant. There's a, there's a few people who are allowed in for a day to pick up material, they're, they're some photos, stuff like that. But there are some communities a little bit further out that have been uh, allowed to return. But certainly the problem they've got, Steve, is there's a couple of towns around the nuclear power plant that they've just decided they've got to use as dumps. So right. even if they were declared safe, they won't be safe now because you've got to dump radioactive material from the site in these towns. I'll let you get back to your day job. Thanks for coming in. Great, Steve. Good to be here. Mark Willisey.